Welcome to the Grow Your Business and Grow Your Wealth podcast with Gary Helt. Gary is an expert in helping business owners put together a plan that will provide a better future for their businesses, themselves, and their families. On the podcast, Gary interviews other professionals who share his vision, and together they share secrets and strategies any business owner can use to build a better financial foundation for your business and your life. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today, our guest is Ido Walney, and he is the founding member of Walney Legal Group. And their practice focuses on estate planning, asset protection, business succession, probate, and trust administration. And he also has experience in uh, business taxes and real estate law. Welcome. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me. So what got you started uh, in, in to become an attorney? What, what, what was it that lit your fire to make you pursue this? So when I was in high school, I had some more distant family members who were attorneys. And so I was given a pretty unique opportunity to spend some summers helping them out. More than anything, I learned the areas of law I didn't want to do. So there was a lot of litigation and I got to see some pretty interesting wrongful death trials and things like that. So that, that was interesting, but that was not up my alley. And so I knew that I didn't want to do that. Um, when I was in high school, uh, going into college, my father bought a company and that was a, a harder process on our family than it should have been. And so I really got interested in business succession and planning based on the experience that he had because, you know, it, it sounded interesting to me. And more than anything, I knew that I could provide future clients a better overall experience than my family received. And so I was fortunate enough that once I graduated law school, I was afforded that opportunity. I've honed my skills and then about 10 years ago, set out and started my own firm. So I've been practicing for about 20 years now. Okay. So what, um, it, what, what, what got you really um, motivated for you know, the estate planning side? I understand you know, business succession and everything else because of your, your family and stuff, but what um, kind of got you into that and, and the, the asset protection side of things? Helping people. You know, I, I, we have a policy here at the firm. It's called Smiles In, Smiles Out. You know, a lot of people go and see a lawyer and, and they're, you know, they've got some sort of problem. It's generally why you see a lawyer and, and they may be smiling because the lawyer is the key to the solution to whatever problem they have. But oftentimes as that relationship matures, the smiles tend to go away. And once those invoices start to appear, the smiles tend to go away. You know, estate planning is an area where there generally isn't an adverse party. There's not a you know, other side of the litigation or other side of the dispute, really the only adverse party we're generally dealing with is the IRS and, you know, everybody hates them anyway. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not an off-putting area of the law. It's one where we literally can help clients in a way that isn't taking away from someone else. We're just helping them get their affairs in order or administer their affairs once someone has passed away. I really felt like this was an area of the law where without having to do a lot of fighting, because I don't like the fighting, we could add a lot of value to clients' lives. And to me, that was really attractive. You know, I, I sleep well at night. I'm not worried about, you know, fighting with people or people coming after my clients. I, I, it gives me a lot of satisfaction. And so that's why I, I love this area of the law. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty awesome that, uh, you know, again, I, I feel the same way. I like helping people and I really like, um, you know, finding ways to, to help them sleep at night also, um, but not having to worry about the, the constant fighting and, and negativism uh, is, is important. Absolutely. So what are some of the questions that clients should be asking you when they come in the door that they're really not asking you? You know, that's interesting. To me, having done this for 20 years, I, I've learned to read between the lines a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So very often a client will come in the door and say, well, I need a will. Well, wills are great, but they're generally not the only thing that people need. And so to me, when someone comes in and says, I need a will, 
that is code for, I need an estate plan and I don't know the right questions to ask you. Mm -hmm. And so we, we will take them through a full process and really any good estate planner should be doing this where you're gathering information, both financial and family related and trying to synthesize what it is the goals of the clients are. You know, I think for clients, an important thing to, to, to ask yourself before you contact a lawyer is, you know, start to parse together in your own head, you know, where you want your assets to go. Is it your spouse and then your kids? Is it charity? If you're single, you know, where are those assets going to go? You know, single people with no spouse and no kids often think they have the simplest estates because there aren't other people to muddy them up. When in fact, those are the most complicated estates. You know, when you've got a spouse and you've got children, the plan basically writes itself. But when you've got literally every organization and an individual in the world as a potential beneficiary, that can get really complicated and overwhelming. So, you know, do a little bit of soul searching, figure out what it is generally that you want, and then find a, a, a reputable estate planning attorney who can really help um, you know, find the details, refine the details of your planning and ultimately draft you some good documents. So I know that, that I run across people all the time that think that, um, oh, well, you know, I got a uh, power of attorney over mom and dad's affairs. Um, can you explain a little bit about, you know, really what, what that power of attorney um, does and when mom and dad pass away, is that power of attorney any good anymore? So generally speaking, powers of attorney are documents that give someone else the rights that you have onto yourself. So there are any number of powers of attorney, but generally they fall into one of two categories. There's generally a healthcare power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. So the health power of attorney is... Uh, it differs a little bit state to state, but generally speaking, you're talking about a document that is going to address end of life type situations. You know, whether you can be admitted to a nursing home, whether you can be removed from a feeding tube, whether or not your organs are going to be donated. You know, these are decisions that you might want to make, but for obvious reasons, probably aren't going to be in a position to do that. Um, and then the other kind of power of attorney is a financial power of attorney, where you will give someone else under certain circumstances, um, whether narrow or broad powers to manage certain financial issues. You know, you can give someone power of attorney to sell your house, or you can give someone power of attorney to manage everything related to money that is in your life. Um, obviously that's very broad, but the most important thing to understand is that powers of attorney, regardless of what they are, by definition, expire on death. And so you're not going to be able to use those powers of attorney once someone has passed away because those powers die with them. So does that mean then I have to go to court to um, get appointed as personal representative for them after that? Or how does that work? Uh, so herein lies the classic lawyerly answer. It depends. <laughs> it depends what other documents they have. So if all they had was a power of attorney, then yes, there's not going to be a will. There's not going to be a trust. Um, if they held assets with beneficiary designations or some sort of other transferability powers. So let's say it's life insurance. That's going to have a beneficiary designation so you don't have to go to court. If you've got a POD, uh, payable on death, or TOD, transferable on death, designation on certain bank and investment accounts, you know, those will help transfer those assets on death. But your will or your trust, those are uh, the documents of last resort for getting assets to someone else when you pass. And so if all you had was a power of attorney, and let's say these other designations didn't exist, in order to transfer bank accounts, house, you know, whatever other assets the decedent may have had, if you don't have a will, every state will give you a will. It's called the laws of intestacy. And so you will have to go to court and have the laws of intestacy apply over your assets so that a judge or a court commissioner or some, some government bureaucrat is going to sort of dole out your assets the way the law is set out. Now, the issue there is that that is one size fits all. The government isn't going to get involved and, and take stock of who's in your life and how things should go and what you wanted. You have that opportunity to plan during your lifetime. 
If you choose not to take advantage of that, the government gives you a one size fits all plan. Now for some people, that's gonna be just fine. But for a vast majority of people, it's not going to be fine. And so assets are gonna to go to places you probably didn't want in a manner you probably didn't want. And so that's why doing a will or doing some planning during life is really, really important. It's the only way to hesitate to use the word assure, but, but be more assured that the assets are gonna to go to where you wanted and not where someone else wanted. So this sounds like you can make a ton of mistakes trying to, trying to figure this out on your own. Um, what is, besides just kind of getting that um, water not so, so muddy, why would, why would somebody need to use a professional like you? What other um, mistakes can they make um, that could be costly to them? So I have a job for a reason. Um, I, we make far more money with people who make mistakes than people who do things right. Uh, the fact of the matter is fixing mistakes, which we do all the time, costs between five and 10 times more than if you did it right in the first place. Um, and again, there's a, there's a reason I have a job. Everybody needs an estate plan. Everyone over the age of 18, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your socioeconomic status, regardless of whether you think you have a lot or a little, everybody needs some level of planning. Now, some people need more than others, but everybody needs something. So the issue is that if you try to do this on your own and you make a mistake, and mistakes are very easy to come by. I mean, this is an area of the law that is generally considered um, to be far more complicated than it may seem on face, which makes it ripe for mistakes. And the issue is that if you try to do it yourself, whether it's through an uh, organization like LegalZoom or you try to piece together some things on the internet, you don't know what these things can do or should do. Right. And so once you produce a document, you don't know if it's any good. You don't know if what you did on LegalZoom, for example, not to pick on them, but, but you don't know if you did things the right way. Now I can go on there and probably produce something pretty gosh darn good but someone who's just a, a lay person who is going on there and answering some questions, you don't know what you've done right, what you've done wrong, what, what answers you've foreclosed yourself to. And so you just are never gonna know. And the issue with the state planning is that, you know, you, you need it to work the one time it's ultimately gonna be necessary. So whether it's because you've become incapacitated or, or whether because, because you've died, you need you don't get a second try, you don't get a do-over. Those do-overs are very costly and complicated. So for example, if there's a mess with the power of attorney and you've become incapacitated, we can go to court and get a guardianship over you, but that's gonna be 10 times more expensive than having gotten the power of attorney right in the first place. And it's a pretty easy document. The next, you know, the best example I can give of this is, is Terry Schiavo. This is a little bit of a dated example now, but there was the famous case of the woman in Florida who accidentally, um, you know, she became incapacitated, uh, I think at a birthday party and was incapacitated, didn't have healthcare powers of attorney in place. And there was a battle between her parents and her husband for about a decade over how she would want to be treated. And the state of Florida ended up getting involved. It cost taxpayers millions of dollars. Um, it was a complete mess. A simple healthcare power of attorney, a document we can produce in no time would have saved all of that. But because she didn't have it, a, a, a legal battle for a decade ensued. Now that's an extreme case, but it's a case that illustrates the point. So, I mean, there sounds like there's, you know, obviously you could go on and on, I'm sure, with, with, with examples of, of this type of thing. Um, obviously, the, the, you know, clients come in, they have these fears because they don't know what to do. You guys, you know, are able to, to help them out. Um, talk a little bit about, okay, great, we got all these documents set up and everything else. But what about when, you know, we need to actually put these into place because, you know, mom or dad passed away or whatever. 
is it something that you really need to go back to the person who wrote them or, you know, obviously, you know, like you talked about, it's like, okay, somebody gets, gets this done when they're 22 years old, life has changed. I mean, is this, this to me is a li living, breathing document now because my life changes. How do, how, how do you handle that type of thing? Sure. So this, this is not a toaster oven. You can't set it and forget it. Right. So we generally recommend that you review these documents about every three to five years, depending on circumstances. And the issues are that, as you said, the laws change, uh, situations change and evolve, people get married, people get divorced, people are born, people die. People, frankly, just come in and out of your life. So you may have named your best friend as an executor, but then you had a falling out and now you don't ever talk to that person. Right. Well, now the documents need to be updated. You know, that's just a fact of life. Um, and again, circumstances change, the laws change. Here in the state of Wisconsin, we had a total reboot of the trust code a, a couple or three years ago. And so it was just a good time for a lot of people to dust off those documents and see if the new trust code impacted the planning that they had done. These things just happen. And so we recommend about every three to five years that they review the documents. In terms of administration, you know, again, you, you want to make sure that you keep your documents current to your situation. We generally recommend that you've got copies of documents distributed to important people in your life. You know, don't hide them. Don't lock them away somewhere where no one will ever find them because then when you need them, no one will know where they are. And so the lawyers may keep a copy or they may not. Um, we generally keep copies, but not the originals. But, you know, if your children or your best friend or the, the people that you name all the doc in all the documents have copies of them, it makes it easier for them to administer things during a time of need because you've passed away or become incapacitated. So that's, it's important. In terms of which lawyer to deal with, you know, a properly drafted document is going to be good regardless of the lawyer who drafted them. So would we like to administer the documents we write? Sure, but we don't name ourselves in any of the documents. Our documents can be administered by any anybody who wants to. Um, and so you don't have to go back to the original lawyer. You're certainly free to, but you know, the world is a lot bigger place than it used to be. People travel around now more than they used to. It's not as if you're in a, a town where there's one lawyer, or maybe you are, a town where there's one lawyer, right? And so I, that lawyer does everything for everyone. Um, where we are and where probably most of the people listening to these uh, podcasts are, you have choice of, of people who are going to do the work. So find an attorney you feel comfortable with. If it happens to be the, the drafting attorney, great. If it's not, that should be fine too. So you mentioned about people moving around and things like that. So if I move from Maryland to say Wisconsin, is that a reason to have somebody uh, review my, my paperwork? It is simply because it's a good pickup point, right? You've, you've got a good reason to do that. So the documents may or may not need to be redone. Um, in this case, I happen to know that Maryland is an individual property state. Wisconsin happens to be a marital property state. So there are some marital property implications there. Now, that's not a deal breaker. And the documents that are drafted in Maryland probably say that they'll be uh, executed under Maryland law, really, regardless of where you're at. The most important documents are to make sure that, for example, the health care power of attorney is uh, suitable for the state that you're in. So all 50 states promulgate a model health care powers of attorney. Remember, these are the powers of attorney that deal with end, a lot of end of life type situations. So every one of the 50 states has a model document. N none of them is great. We tend to use, for example, in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin version of the document. Why do we do that? Now, I know that I can draft a far better healthcare power of attorney document than what's in the code, just like I do that for the model durable power of attorney. Um, I don't like the model durable power of attorney, so I completely redraft it. The reason I don't do that for the healthcare power of attorney is because if I'm executing the financial power of attorney, I have no issues with the attorney for the bank, the financial institution, the title company, taking my document and running it by their legal department and you know, figuring out if the document does what we need it to do or not. 
But when you're in an end of life situation or a medical crisis situation, you don't want the hospital to have to go to their legal department yeah. or go to court to get an interpretation. I generally tell people, I don't want a hospital to read 50 documents drafted by 50 lawyers for 50 different patients. You want that doctor to whip out that document and without reading it, know what yes and no and what the questions are. So every state's got a version of that. And so if you move from, for example, Maryland to Wisconsin, it's a good idea to get that updated because the probability of you winding up in a hospital in Wisconsin goes way up. And so that's just a good pickup time to have someone local review the documents, talk to you about the implications of um, what you did in the new jurisdiction. If the documents are great and can be salvaged, great. If not, better to know than to not know. That's, that's, that's great advice. And going through one of the things that you guys do is, is asset protection. What are some of the things for the high net worth clients that you guys are doing in asset protection that, that helps save them in taxes? So there's any which vehicle to do that. It really depends on the nature of their assets, the goals that they have. Um, what their risk tolerances are, what their time frames are. Some things can be set up faster than others. Um, some assets lend themselves better to asset protection planning than others. I, I think the most important thing to understand about asset protection is that asset protection needs to be done with clean hands. You know, when we have someone call us and say, do you do asset protection? The first thing we ask them is, you know, do, do you have reason to believe you've got a creditor or that a creditor will be materializing relatively soon? Because if the answer is yes, which is often why they're asking in the first place, then you're not going to be able to do asset protection as to that creditor. Um, that's a, it would be a fraudulent conveyance. Um, anything that's done to defraud a creditor just doesn't work. You've got to do the planning with clean hands before you've you believe that someone would be coming after the assets. Otherwise, all that time and effort is going to be for naught. And so I think regardless of the actual asset protection and the tax savings that are at play, that's probably the biggest misconception that people have. They think that they can wait for an issue to develop and then start protecting assets. I would draw the, the parallel to insurance, right? You can't wait until you've got a problem and then try to insure for that. No insurance company is going to insure it because it's not insurance at that point. It's free money. You know, you can't get life insurance after you've died. That's a bad bet for the life insurance company. It's the same thing with asset protection. As long as it's a fair game, asset protection works. Once you already know you've got a problem, it doesn't work anymore. So what are some of the, the challenges that you're facing now? Um, you know, you know, let's exclude uh, COVID for a minute. You know, what are some of the things that, that as a, um, you know, business owner and so forth, are you guys facing at this point? So the biggest challenge we have right now is time. So we're recording this podcast at the end of October. Mm -hmm. There's a big election coming up next week. Right. And uh, the general thought is that there's going to be a Democratic sweep of the House, the Senate, and the White House. Now, that may or may not happen. But if it does, there's a lot of concern that that's going to impact the tax code. It's going to impact some of the laws related to trust planning and that some of the tools that are available to us now are going to go away. So I've been preaching about this risk for about a year. I, I always believe that you, you, you can't wait to see how things shake out before you start to do planning. That you, just, you will run out of time. Right. So the biggest challenge for us professionally right now is that with the election about a week away, the phones are ringing off the hook with people who have finally come to the realization that you know, this could be a reality. And some of the things that I've been thinking about might not be possible anymore. I mean, we've got historically high federal estate exemption amounts. I mean, historically high by a lot. And if those go away, and I, by the way, think that there's a high probability that they will, you know, millions of dollars in, in the ability to move them to next generation or into trust could poof away in an instant. And once that goes away, at least for the next four years, that that, uh, you know, that tool will be gone. And so people have it now, they know it could go away. And so there's a lot of demand and 
you know, frankly, the estate planning industry, like a lot of financial services, is woefully under, um, under person, you know, there's not enough people to do the work. And so a lot of people are simply going to run out of time. We're going to be working a lot of long hours and weekends and help as many people as we can. But, you know, if the fiscal cliff in 2012 was any indication, there's simply going to be people left out in the cold because they waited too long. Right. I mean, even if, even if the election doesn't happen the, 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 this way, um, you know, we still have the, you know, 2026, as we know it, the tax laws, as we know them right now, go away. So one way or another, we, we you know, we need to deal with this um, as we're going. Correct. What, tell me something that you know now that you wish you knew when you first started out? Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I don't know that it's specifically something that I didn't know then, but it, it, it never ceases to surprise me the number of people who simply don't do planning. Right. Um, the statistic is that around somewhere between, depending on what study you read, somewhere between 60 and 70% of all adults in the U.S. do not have an estate plan. That's a huge number. It's made even worse by virtue of the fact that of the 30 to 40 percent that actually do have an estate plan, 60 to 70 percent of those are either outdated or inappropriate for the client because they haven't been updated properly. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about, you know, 30 percent of 30 percent that actually have a good estate plan right now. I mean, it's 10 to 15 percent of the population. Right. To me, that's a staggering statistic. To me, it's, I mean, Frank, again, it's why I have a job. Right. You know, we make far more money off people who don't do planning or make big mistakes than the people who do the planning, even high net worth planning. And so, you know, I, I, I had a good sense of um, people not doing the planning, but I think it's, it's really it's really been something that I've come to terms with over the course of my 20 year career, the sheer number of people who don't do the planning properly. And, and that statistic has stayed level my entire career. You know, as a young attorney, you always think you're gonna go in there and, and, and you know, change that number, but I'm, I'm one person. I'm one, you know, a member of one firm and we're talking about millions and millions and millions and millions of people who don't do planning. And I, myself or in my entire team and frankly, every estate planner in existence today, just, we, we can't make that number go down. So um, that's, it's been eye-opening, right? It's been sobering. Yeah, I, that's something that I really run into a lot myself in, you know, trying to get clients to do tax planning because, you know, just like yours, if, if you plan this out, you have a lot better chance of reducing any liability that you would have, or at least have an idea of what you're going to do. Um, and lots of times when, you know, I talk to people, they're like, well, you know, shouldn't you just be telling me this stuff anyway? And it's like, well, you know, you're paying somebody to prepare a tax return for you. You're not paying them necessarily to give you tax advice, to do tax planning. Um, and yes, we push it with them, just like you do. If somebody comes in and says, hey, I want a will, we, we kind of push it. But, but again, I, I would bet you that our statistics are pretty much right where yours are with the number of people that, that um, aren't doing planning, um, especially with people with, with businesses. I'm, I'm amazed at the number of people that have businesses that don't do any type of tax planning or any planning, succession planning or anything else with their businesses and something happens to them they can't continue or whatever it is in this asset, great asset that they had, you know, just kind of falls apart because there's nobody there to keep it, to keep it moving. You know, I come from a long line of entrepreneurs, both of my grandfather's own businesses. My dad owns a business. Now I own a business. You know, I, I appreciate the entrepreneurial spirit. It, I mean, you have to be a little nuts to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. And so a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they just want to make it to tomorrow. They want to make it to next week. They want to make it to next month. And whatever they need to do to get there, that's what they do. 
And so what I often find with these business owners is that, you know, that strategy is great until you turn around and look at the mess that you've created doing these stopgap measures. And so, you know, I appreciate the survival instinct of entrepreneurs, but at some point you've got to take stock of, A, why are you doing this? You right. know, presumably to make money for yourself and leave a legacy for your family. Well, if that's the case, you, you can't let the value go to zero because you didn't do any planning. And also think of all of the mistakes that you've made, you know, piecing people together. I mean, do, do the exercise, turn around and look at the mess you've created and then hire someone to help clean that up because that's where, you know, you're going to make a huge difference. I'm, I often think back to, thankfully, not a client of mine. I, I was brought in far after the fact, but, you know, a business owner who built a really great business and, and the business success and strategy was one day, this will be my son's business. And literally what happened was, you know, one morning, the keys to the front door of the business were left on the table. Dad retired, son all of a sudden came in. So when you do that, you know, the tax returns you file are pretty dramatically different. And the IRS got wind of this and they said, well, how was the business transition? And, you know, by any legal definition, there was a gift, right? Dad yeah. gifted the business to son. Well, you can't just do that. And so there was a giant tax bill that was levied against dad. And now dad is out of the business. Dad doesn't have an income and dad's got to pay that tax. Well, right. that's a bad result. And that was so easily avoided. I mean, you can't just say the, the succession plan is I'm going to turn over the keys one day. If it were that simple, everyone would do it. That simply doesn't work. Yeah, that's 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 another great example of, of where planning, you know, comes into play so much, um, you know, and there's so many different things, not, you know, just from a tax standpoint, but OK, does son really know anything about the business and, and are the employees going to be behind them and so forth and so on. So, yeah, there's there's a, a ton of things there with the, the planning part that is just um I'm just, I'm really amazed at the number of people who don't plan. And I don't care what it's, what it's for, taxes, you know, estates or, or insurance or anything else uh, that really need to, to do some planning. Well, how is dad going to pay his bills? You know, let's, yeah. under the scenario where you just turn the business over, you know, a very simple question. How, how are you going to live the rest of your life? You know, have you saved? Do you need a stream of income? What about consulting for son? Because son may not know the various vendors and clients that you've got. You know, at least in theory, you know, and this ties back to the estate planning. You know, you're only going to die once. You're only going to transition your business once. So there aren't, you know, as a, on the client side of the table, you're not going to have a lot of experience to draw from. And the benefit of a professional is that we do this day in, day out. And so we've seen it. And you as the client should benefit from our experience and the mistakes of others to get to the best situation that you can for yourself. And you're simply not going to be able to do that on your own. And no amount of internet research is going to get you there. Right. You really need the help of professionals to get you there. And, I, and, and I'm going to say also with that is you need to make sure that you have professionals that do this day in and day out. You know, uh, grabbing an attorney that does not have the succession planning um, experience or grabbing a, a, and I tell people all the time with a CPA, it's like, you know, that CPA may be great at doing personal taxes, but they don't know what the rules are for doing business taxes and things like that. And it's really important to get somebody who is specialized in that area and not somebody who's kind of a, a, a jack of all trades. Um, so if, if, if somebody wants to reach out to you, um, and, and get you to help them? How do they do that? Yeah, the best way to reach me is to um, either send me an email. The email address is ewalney at walneylegal.com or go to the website, walneylegal.com. Um, you know, we service a national and even international clientele, so physical location is not that important. But if you're looking for someone local to you and, and I'm not a good fit, then you know, again, to your point, Gary, I, I really am a big believer in finding a specialist who does estate planning. You know, the, the smartest brain surgeon in the world can't help you if you've got a lung infection. Um, you know, you need a lung doctor, an ear, ears, nose, and throat doctor for that. And so estate planning is one of those areas that the best divorce lawyer, the best litigator can't help you. 
find a good estate planner. And, and I generally recommend that people look on uh, the NAPEC website as uh, www.naepc.org. That's the National Association of Estate Planners and Councils. You can do a geographic search for an estate planning law specialist. That is a very, very uh, difficult designation to get. I happen to hold it. Um, but those people have been vetted very thoroughly. So find an, an EPLS that is uh, local to you. That person is going to be pretty reliable. Wow. A lot, of, a lot of information in a short period of time you've given us. Um, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, it's been Ida Walney with Walney Legal Group. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Gary. I appreciate the opportunity. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.